Welcome back. In this lecture, we will look at the simplest circuit that is utilized for representing the physical chemical processes at the electrode electrolyte interface. The circuit is called the Randall circuit. And it is also useful for getting a measure of some characteristic time scales of relevance at the electrode electrolyte interface. So let's get started and look at our conception of the electrode electrolyte interface. We began this course looking at structures like this. If the electrode is polarized cathodically, we interpreted that to mean that the electrode is being charged negatively. Because it's a metallic structure, all the charges are at the surface of the metal. In response to this cathodic polarization, or negative charge at the surface, positive charges in the electrolyte get preferentially absorbed onto the electrode surface. In contrast, if the electrode is anodically polarized, then there is an accumulation of positive charge at the electrode surface. In response to this, there's a preferential absorption of negative charges from the electrolyte onto the electrode surface whether the ions interact via the solvated so solvation sheath or directly get absorbed to the electrode surface depends upon the affinity of the solvation layer to the ions. So that is not of relevance here. But the point to note is that because of polarization of the electrode, there's preferential adsorption of a particular kind of ions onto the electrode surface. So this capacitor is called a double layer capacitor because this, has, this is one layer and this is the second layer. This is a double layer electrochemical capacitor. So to represent the processes at this interface, a reasonable circuit is the following. Let us interpret why this is so. So this working electrode corresponds to one of these electrodes. And this double layer capacitor is what is shown here, that depends upon the double layer charging. The greater the capacity at this electrode surface, greater will be the capacitance here. For this ions to get preferentially absorbed onto the electrode surface, they have to be transported from the bulk or from the near surface to the surface of the electrode. So that depends upon the ohmic drop in the electrode, uh, in the electrolyte. Okay, so for the ions to get absorbed, they have to be transported uh, in the electrolyte and reach the electrode surface. So the ohmic drop or the resistance for that transport will be in series to this capacitor. That also makes sense. So then there is this other resistor which is in parallel to this capacitor. So here it is indicated as RF. F indicates Faraday current. So what is Faraday current? Faraday current uh, is the current due to electron transfer across the electrode electrolyte interface. That means there's an explicit electrochemical reaction. The typical uh, electrochemical reaction which we consider is an oxidized species O plus N electrons give rise to reduced species, okay? So if this uh, such kind of electron transfer is possible, we say Faraday current is present. Overall, uh, the current across an electrode electrolyte interface can have two forms. One is the Faraday component, another is the capacitative component. It is not necessary that both of them have to be present all the time. In some cases, one of this can be absent. So, unless the potential of the electrode is well above the equilibrium potential, um, unless it is sufficiently polarized above the equilibrium potential, Faraday current will not exist. Likewise, the capacitative current is given by this formula, right? How do we get this? Q is equal to C times V, and we assume C to be independent of um, potential. So dQ by dt is I, is equal to C times dV by dt. 
So capacitive current will be present only when there is change in voltage with respect to time. And there are potentials wherein Faraday current will be absent. And there are cases where both the current components will be present. Let's move forward and use the circuit to derive some time scale. So if you notice, uh, in this, we have adequately represented, at least to first level of approximation, the working electrode electrolyte interface, but we have indicated counter electrode in rather simplistic manner. We have not really indicated uh, anything about the double layer involved with the counter electrode. So from here to here, it is mostly the working electrode electrolyte interface that is being represented. So how do we use this kind of circuit to get some characteristic uh, time scale? Let us see that now. So to do that, we can use Kirchhoff's voltage law and look at the potential drop involved in this part of the circuit. Here, the capacitor is in series with the um, uh, ohmic resistor. So if the overall potential drop is V, we can decompose that into potential drop due to capacitor and the potential drop due to the resistor. Um, so by just substituting for the potential of the capacitor, we get this equation. This is a simple linear first order uh, differential equation. This can be integrated to get this as Q is correlated to V via the constant C, uh, we can substitute um, for Q uh, as C times V and get this equation. We can rearrange this, all this to get the expression for current. So the current is given by this expression. So what is to be noted here is this is the capacitive current. Um, and this depends upon uh, the following uh, quantities. So here, this is a dimensionless quantity. So RC as a dimension of time. So this gives us an estimate of the time constant of relevance to capacitance of the capacitors mentioned here. So this kind of analysis you must have done in your first year general physics uh, class. Just go back to refresh. Uh, these concepts. But what is of importance here to our discussion is this characteristic time constant relevant to the double layer capacitor, electrochemical double layer capacitors. So let's look at this expression. This time constant is greater if the capacitance is greater. That makes sense, right? If the capacitance is larger, that is, there are a lot of binding sites at the electrode surface for the ions to bind, then the capacitance is greater. Therefore, it will take larger time to charge that interface. And in addition, if the transport of the ions from the bulk or near surface to the surface, if that resistance is greater, then the time constant for charging will also be larger. So physically also, this particular formula of tau uh, which is the characteristic time constant of this particular capacitor being related to R omega times C makes sense. So let us compare this time constant, that is the capacitive uh, time constant, which we have just substituted for resistance and obtained this formula. This is the conductivity and characteristic length um, of the particular system we are looking at. So we want to compare this time constant with certain other processes that can occur at the electrode electrolyte surface. There can be many processes, but we will just look at one particular process, which is the diffusion, uh, diffusive processes. Earlier, in an earlier lecture, we had looked at the characteristic diffusion length, which uh, characteristic diffusion length scale, which goes as square root of diffusion coefficient times we had done this when we had looked at the Cotterell equation. So from here, we can get the 
characteristic time constant for diffusive processes. So this again, this kind of um, expressions you might have seen when you differentiated the ballistic motion um, uh, as against uh, diffusive processes in your mass transfer or transport phenomena classes. So anyway, this is the characteristic time constant for diffusive processes. And we want to compare these two. Uh, the objective here is we have got an expression for two time constants, one related to capacitative uh, processes, another related to diffusive processes. So we also saw these relationship when we discussed the Cottrell equation, wherein current um, was proportional to one by root t. So if you go back and look at those analysis, the we never took into account the capacitative current while uh, deriving the Cottrell equation. Why is that so? So the reason for this is if you plug in the characteristic values uh, from experimental data, okay, so that the conductivity, double air capacitance, and the characteristic length scale, what you observe is that the time scale for diffusion is much larger than the time scale for uh, characteristic time scale for capacitance, uh, capacitative charging. That is only when very short time scale, the capacitive current plays a role. Um, and under long time scale, it is only the diffusion uh, that plays a role. So that is the reason why when we derive the Cottrell equation, we completely neglected the capacitive current. So the essence of this analysis, it gives us comparison of the two time scales, the capacitive time scale and the diffusive time scale. So let us consider a process wherein a particular aspect of electrochemical interface becomes apparent. So here, what are we considering? At time uh, 20 seconds, there is a sudden increase in current. Okay, So that's the experiment which we are looking at. Corresponding to that, we are also looking at the potential changes that are involved in this with respect to the sudden increase in current that occurs at 20 uh, seconds. So we can decompose this potential into three components. One is due to the sudden increase in current, there is ohmic um, O potential. And then at short time scale, because there is a sudden change in current, in, it involves a rather large capacitive current, so this is being blown up here. So the, this very narrow region okay, uh, between 20 seconds to 20.5 seconds, capacitive current do play a role. Okay? So that is the only time they do play a role. But after that, uh, there is not much change in potentials. Okay? So the capacitive current decays and uh, the potential change to maintain the constant current is just because of diffusional processes. So in a typical process, in this case, um, when you want to operate at constant current, okay, so there are three processes, uh, ohmic activation processes, there is capacitive processes, and there are diffusive processes. And all three things have different time constants. Okay? So, um, so because of this, there are coupling of time constants. And what you measure is a convoluted result it can be deconvoluted to identify what are the characteristic physical chemical processes that occur at the electrode electrolyte interface. There is one final issue uh, with respect to this lecture. If you remember, we started all these experimental measurements by mentioning a three electrode setup. So even though the action is at the working electrode, uh, the current at the working electrode is compensated by the current at the counter electrode, and there's no um, current that passes through the reference electrode, ideally. So in the equivalent circuit here, we have neglected the features of double layer corresponding to the counter electrode electrolyte interface. Why is that so? So um, we already said that the rate processes at the counter electrode should not impede uh, the rate processes 
at the working electrode. That is, the electron transfer at the counter electrode should be facile compared to the electron transfer at the working electrode. Okay. So one way to do that is have a very large counter electrode. Okay. And it also has certain other advantage. Let's see what. So if the okay, if the counter electrode rate processes are much more facile compared to uh, the working electrode, uh, automatically the RF corresponding to the counter electrode becomes negligibly small. Then we are left with the considerations of double layer capacitance at the counter electrode electrolyte interface. So let us think through this. Uh, we have this characteristic time scale which is equal to R omega, which corresponds to this resistance times capacitance. So if all the dynamics depends upon the capacitance of the working electrode, in, in some ways we have neglected the capacitance of the counter electrode. Why is that so? So to look at this, we have to go back again to our first year general physics. If two capacitance are in series, like the capacitance at this interface and the capacitance at this interface, the equivalent capacitance is written in the following manner. Just look up Wikipedia, you will get this formula, or look at your first year general physics book, you will get this formula. So if you look at the equivalent capacitance, the capacitance is dominated by the smallest capacitance. Okay, So we, we already said that the counter electrode is much larger, uh, even though this is not uh, schematically represented in re accurate experiments, the counter electrode uh, is much larger than the working electrode. Corresponding to the much larger counter electrode, the capacitance of the counter electrode electrolyte interface is also larger. So uh, the dynamics or the equivalent capacitance is ultimately decided by the smaller of the two capacitance, which is the smaller of the two capacitance is the capacitance that exists between the working electrode and the electrolyte. And because of this, the entire dynamics of the system is dependent upon just the smaller of the two capacitance, uh, which is the capacitance of the working electrode electrolyte interface. So uh, it is reasonable approximation to neglect both the RF and the capacitance at the counter electrode electrolyte um, interface. So with this, we'll move on to a very important topic, which is called the cyclic voltammetry. We have already done a demonstration of this experiment uh, in the lab. So this is fairly complex topic. Uh, we'll at least uh, do a semi-quantitative analysis in the next lecture. Thank you.